A week of Falcons training camp is in the books, and I want to run through my notebook with you guys, starting with the defense during Wednesday's practice finally woke up. Something we have been waiting for. I don't know if it was my mini rant I had last week about the defense getting off to way slow of a start, even for training camp standards, but they woke up, and it was a nice refresher to see. You want to have some healthy competition between the offense and defense. The last thing you want to see is one side of the football dominate the other all camp long. If the defense is dominating in camp, it's going to be a lot like the Falcons offense last year. But the Falcons defense during Wednesday's training camp practice had six sacks. Six sacks. We're almost at Bueller's nine times. And you can't actually sack the quarterback. So, and this offensive line, I think, is top 10 in the NFL. It's closer to five than 10. But the front five for the Falcons is a question mark. We just don't really know what to expect when the top two sack leaders from last year did not return. But the six sacks, they all came from different players as well, which was really cool to see. You had Grady Jarrett. That's awesome. Braylon Trice, the rookie. Contavia Street. Troy Anderson. Caden Ellis. And Milo Eifer all getting in on the sack fest. Now, as for Michael Penix, if you're wondering what he was looking like going up against this Falcons defense, he's been rotating in with the first and second team offense, but it's not a 50-50 rotation. It's more like 75% with the second team going with the second team offense against second team defense and 25% against the first team. So just giving Kirk Cousins a little bit of a breather a little bit from time to time as he works his way back from his Achilles injury. But getting back to the defense and maybe the middle of it, Defensive tackle, Eddie Goldman. So remember Eddie Goldman. He signed with the Falcons in 2021. He retired. He came back the next year. Retired. Came back again this year. And this time it looks like it's going to stick. Eddie Goldman has gotten off to a really strong start so far in camp. The reports coming out of Flowery Branch are the way he showed up to training camp at the end of July. He was in much better shape than when he showed up to OTAs and stuff back in the spring. A lot of guys kind of take those six weeks off after mini camp and before training camp. And I think coaches can tell which guys really worked during that six week stretch and which guys maybe enjoyed some vacations and breakfast buffets. And for a big guy like Eddie Goldman, it can be very easy to get tempted by the breakfast buffets. Not this guy. No, Eddie Goldman was spotted running with the first team offense on numerous occasions as if he's going to be a mainstay, which if you think about it, that's not too surprising since, like, the last time he was on the NFL field, he was a starter, right? Second-round draft pick by the Chicago Bears. He was a permanent starter on that defensive line right in the middle. They ran, well, at, when he was there, they went from a 4-3 defense to a 3-4, but still, he was that nose tackle, middle of the field, uh, middle of the line, like David Onyemata. And his best season by far was 2018. The Bears, remember, that's when they went to the playoffs. And fortunately for Chicago fans, not the outcome they were looking for in that first round against the Eagles. But three sacks, 40 tackles. He put together some really good campaigns. But then he skips 2020 because of COVID. And at the end of 2021, there were a lot of question marks in Chicago about just how much Eddie Goldman was committed to this team and how much commitment he had to the sport in general, which why it wasn't too surprising for the folks in the Windy City that after signing with the Falcons, he ended up retiring. But here we are, starting the 2024 season, and Eddie Goldman, I think, could be a real X factor for Atlanta. Let's just be honest with one another. The Falcons defense is not loaded with a bunch of perennial Pro Bowl talent at the edge and outside linebacker position. So if you can generate some extra pressure from the interior, because Eddie Goldman, for being a nose tackle, has proven he can find the quarterback, plus he's a great run stopper. Then you really add in that you're going to have two defensive tackles over the age of 30, one coming off a torn ACL. I don't think Grady Jarrett and David Onyemata still have that same energy they had five years ago. So they might need an extra breather or two. And if you can have a reliable rotational piece like Eddie Goldman filling in, Man, those three guys, they're going to play at a high level from the first quarter to the fourth quarter, from the first week to the 18th week. And that's a position group that as the game goes on and as the season goes on, they start to lose a little bit of energy. Hopefully that won't be a problem for Atlanta with having Eddie Goldman. 
Another piece of the defense I want to talk about is Mike Hughes, who appears to have really grabbed the CB2 job by the horns and has run with it. Now, if you go back to the spring, it was predominantly Clark Phillips lining up opposite of A.J. Terrell at the CB2 job, but there was always a good amount of rotation going on, getting different looks and different personnel on the field. But the consensus is, after the first week of training camp, Mike Hughes has been running with the first-team defense more than Phillips at that CB2 job. Now, some background on Hughes. He was a first-round draft pick by the Minnesota Vikings back in 2018. He didn't stick in Minnesota for too long, uh, only there for three years before beginning to become a bit of a journeyman player. In his career, he's got 22 starts in 72 games, so he's predominantly been a backup cornerback really since the day he was drafted late round one. Now, a season ago, his first year with the Falcons, he was still a backup for Jeff Okuda, and then when they benched Okuda, they still primarily went with Clark Phillips as the outside corner, but 21 tackles, two tackles for loss, one pass breakup. We've seen Hughes flirt with inside and outside as a corner. Now, when it comes to the CB2 battle, we're going to have a winner at the end of training camp, and that winner will be the guy that suits up week one opposite of Terrell. I don't think that the battle is done, though. I think this is going to be a battle that goes into the season, where every single week there's going to be a reassessment for Mike Hughes. That's not the case for, like, A.J. Terrell. If A.J. Terrell has a bad week or two or, God forbid, three in a row, they're not looking to bench him. If Mike Hughes has a bad week and it's just one, that's how short the leash could be till, all right, let's give Clark Phillips a look. So this battle, while it will have a winner at the end of training camp, and it very well could be Hughes if he holds on to the job, which he currently holds, but it's not going to go away just because training camp's over. Now, before we look at the other notes I've got out of camp, if you want some Falcons preseason watch parties, help us reach 23,000 subscribers. We're a little under 300 subs away, so lock yourself in, and that's the number we need to get to get the green light for my bosses to get studio space and a producer to do some more watch parties. Second note I want to reiterate, and you've probably heard it a bunch from other outlets, but I'll beat a dead horse. Kyle Pitts is dominating. Like, there is off-season Kool-Aid. There's off-season training camp hype. And then there's legitimate, this has legs. Kyle Pitts' domination so far in the first week of camp is more than just like, ooh, that's one nice highlight from Twitter. No. Ask anyone with a pair of eyeballs at Falcons training camp about Kyle Pitts, and they'll tell you, He's been probably the best player on the field on both ends. I'll elaborate on that in just a moment, but I do want to show some love to our friends over at Game Time. If you want to get started with the best place to find some tickets for an upcoming Braves game or any other sporting event in your area, download Game Time today. Now, Game Time has this awesome feature called Flash Deals, where you can save even more with exclusive in-app deals on select seats ahead of the game or event. Plus, they offer the game time guarantee. If you find tickets in the same section and row for less, game time will credit you 110% of the difference. So take the guesswork out of buying MLB tickets with game time. Download the game time app, create an account, and use code CHATSPORTS for $20 off your first purchase. Once again, redeem code CHATSPORTS for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply, but I put all that information in the comments and description of today's video. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Now, if you're looking for an absolute just headline for training camp so far, the two stars in my eyes have been Kirk Cousins and then Kyle Pitts. And unfortunately for Kyle Pitts, we just know how the football world operates. Quarterbacks always get a bigger shine and a bigger spotlight. But Kyle Pitts definitely deserves a spotlight and a big one, too. So hopefully we'll get the best season yet out of Pitts, something closer to his 2021 season. But I've seen a lot of people say that, listen, Pitts this year looks a lot more like that 2021 version of himself or the beginning of 2022 before he suffered that knee injury midway through the 2022 season. But the uh, the consensus, like I said, has been Kyle Pitts has looked the best in a while. Sure, we haven't seen a ton of padded practices yet, and 
when you're a physical freak and practices aren't predicated on physicality, sometimes you can separate yourself from the pack a little bit. But I'm choosing to be a simp. I'm drinking the Kyle Pitts Kool-Aid. I'm a believer in him for this season. Now, I know that a lot of people have trust issues with Kyle Pitts, and you're not wrong for that. Like, Fortunately, the last two seasons have been underwhelming. Like, Let's just call it what it is. Have not lived up to the expectations we probably all had when he was a top five draft pick. But I have reason to believe that this year there will be a bit of a turnaround. He's healthy, and his quarterback is no longer Desmond freaking Ritter. Kirk Cousins, that's going to do a lot of favors for number eight. Fourth thing that popped up on my training camp radar that might not have garnished a ton of attention elsewhere, but it caught my eye. A.J. Terrell and his contract situation. Now, Terrell has been an absolute pro about this. He's not holding in. He's not holding out. He's not having hissy fit. He's going to play, and he's going to let his agent work out the contract, and when the phone call comes in for an extension, he'll be happy. But until then, he's focused on being the best possible cornerback for this team. Now, Terry Fontenot, when speaking to the media today, was asked, hey, what's going on with Mr. Terrell's contract? And he said he has no comment on Terrell's contract and any possible extension at this time. That's not the greatest thing to hear. Not that that's an absolute dagger. GMs tend not to or tend to avoid talking about player contracts to the media. But when there is a guy that the team is absolute about extending, usually the response is something like, hey, we're not going to comment on any player's contract, but we love this guy, and we're going to make sure we do everything in our power to keep him here for as long as possible. I didn't get that sense when this question was asked to Fontenot. So hopefully we'll get a really good season out of A.J. Terrell. I mean, the last two years, from just a box score perspective, we're not as eye-popping as his first two seasons. Four picks, 23 pass breakups four forced fumbles, the pr the ball production has dipped. And there are some factors into it. I think some of it could just be placed on Terrell himself for just not executing and getting himself in the right spot. But I also think it's a little bit more difficult to come up with interceptions when the ball stops coming your way. Like, look at the targets his first two years compared to the last two years. When they target you 40 times fewer over the last two seasons, which isn't some sharp decline, but it is a noteworthy decline, you're just not going to have as many opportunities to make those big plays. Now, you can still come up with at least one interception in 156 targets, so that's where the blame can be spread around a little bit, but I think there is some more context to why Terrell the last two years wasn't as big of a producer the first two years. Now, what could an extension look like? We've kind of covered this subject before, but I'll refresh everyone's memories. You can check out the highest paid corners in the NFL. I don't think Terrell is pushing to become a top three highest paid corner. I don't think he's got you know a ton of leverage to get that number two to start his contract. But I think he could land a four-year, $72 million contract. That would pay him $18 million a season and make him the ninth highest paid corner. Right. So for the Falcons... They lock up CB1 for at least the next three years because all contracts are always minus one year. Look at the guaranteed money, which in this case would probably be about $60 million. So three years, $60 million, maybe 55 but we're arguing over a couple of pennies here. Um, I think it's wise for Atlanta to lock Terrell up. I mean, you've already got one question mark at the other cornerback position. Do you really want to go into next offseason searching for two new starting corners? Now, with the new defense coming in, the Falcons are going to go away from a man defense, which Terrell has really thrived in, and go more towards the zone defense, which is what Raheem Morris has done in L.A. My suspicion is the Falcons want to wait and see how Terrell performs in that zone defense. Like, if he gets off to a horrible start the first six weeks, they're probably not going to be in a major rush to extend him. But once they see that he can actually thrive in that new scheme, which I think he's capable of doing, I think there'll be a lot of motivation to get a mid-season extension done. Now, our trivia question for today before we look at the final training camp note after week one, can you name the two Falcons in the N oh, not NFL Pro Football Hall of Fame that are also in the Falcons' ring of honor? So I'll give you kind of a hint. Brett Favre is in the Pro Football Hall of Fame, and he goes in as technically 
a Falcon. Like, even though he's not really a Falcon, like he did, you know, get drafted by them and whatnot. So he does go down as a Falcon in the Hall of Fame. So there's only two guys that are Falcon in the Hall of Fame and in the Atlanta Falcons' very own Ring of Honor. Let's see if we can get at least one of those two. Fourth and final note, kind of one to end on. Not a happy note necessarily, depending on what conspiracy theories you believe in, but an intriguing note as most teams kind of have their rookies go through some, hazing's a big, you know, scary trigger word, but some level of it of, hey, you're the new guy, you're going to carry my helmet and shoulder pads in after practice. Like, that type of stuff is not uncommon, but the Falcons are going about a little bit differently. They're having their rookies as they stay over at the facility during training camp. As a team build, building exercise, having the rookies present PowerPoint arguments for conspiracy theories. So far, linebacker D JT Bertrand is the most persuasive, Kirk Cousins said. Won't say subject, but quote, I can't go there. It's too edgy. Now, everyone loves to have that one conspiracy theory that they're a big believer in. And I thought about going through my like top cons conspiracy theories I believe in. I'm not a huge conspiracy theorist believer. Like I really don't like the idea, and maybe this is just me being too big of a patriot, but the idea that we faked the moon landing. Do you know how many people worked at NASA? How many people have to keep that lie going? So I don't like, and I don't buy that one whatsoever. Um, I used to be somewhat of a believer that Hitler did not commit suicide. YouTube's not going to like that word. Uh, but yeah, the H man did not commit suicide and that he got on a plane and went to Argentina and Brazil. No, I don't think that one anymore. I watched, I spent a whole day in bed watching like this discovery channel going through it all. So, the only one that I actually think has some serious legs to it is the Denver Airport one, which I'm not really sure what it is other than there was a budget and a timeline for Denver to complete their airport. They vastly exceeded their budget, and it took like an extra three years because they're building some government tunnels essentially underneath the airport, going into like the mountains of the Rockies as like a doomsday home to go to. I don't think the government's even trying to hide that one anymore. Like, if you've ever been to the Denver airport, it's very weird. And lately, they've been doing some construction. And even, like, the little, like, walls that, like, hide the construction, they make jokes about, we're doing conspiracy shit over here. So, I'll go at the Denver airport one. Let me know what your, what's a, I guess, what conspiracy theory do you believe the most? Uh, okay, going back to that trivia question, though. Name the two Falcons in the Hall of Fame and the Ring of Honor. There's only two guys that overlap. There's 11 Falcons in the Hall of Fame. And until Arthur Blank and Matt Ryan get inducted, there are nine players in the Falcons' Ring of Honor. Those two guys overlapping, former defensive lineman Claude Humphrey, and, of course, primetime Deion Sanders. So I was surprised to see such little overlap, but there it is. Like Tony Gonzalez. I know he didn't play too long for the Falcons, so maybe you don't want to be too liberal with just handing out ring of honors to great players at the end of their career, but like that's an example of, wow, kind of would have thought he'd be in the ring of honor. All right, that will do it for us on today's show. I appreciate everyone for hanging out with us. Enjoy the rest of your day, and I'll catch up with you all later on another edition of Falcons Today.